Over the course of the next several lectures, I want to look at the chemical effects of a surrounding medium on a system of interest. And so that surrounding medium uh, is some sort of condensed phase. The most common one would be a homogeneous solvent, but we'll consider the effects of others as well. So in this first lecture in the series, I want to actually look at the chemical phenomena, and later we'll discuss how computationally to account for the interactions with a surrounding medium when doing various types of calculations. So what condensed phases are important in chemistry? Well, of course, there are several. And as I mentioned a moment ago, homogeneous liquid solutions are arguably the most common condensed phases in experimental chemistry. It's the liquid you pour into a flask as part of doing a reaction, for instance. And so most of the focus will be on, on such uh, homogeneous liquid solutions, but I'll try to make connections to other sorts of condensed phases along the way. Solids are a very interesting condensed phase. They differ from liquids, of course, by having some uh, greater structural order associated with them. Surfaces are the interface between two different media. Liquid crystal solutions, those are special kinds of solutions that, uh, again, have some non-homogeneity associated with them. They're not isotropic, typically. Supercritical fluids, so if you take a substance beyond its critical temperature, you will have a fluid-like medium, but it behaves neither as a gas or as a liquid, but has properties of both. Membranes, which are condensed phases that separate two other phases. And I want to make a, a final note here that distinguishing with what constitutes the condensed phase and what constitutes your system of interest can sometimes be challenging. That is, it's not obvious that a first salvation shell, for instance, should be thought of as solvent as opposed to perhaps being an intimate part of a molecular complex. And a, a good example of that might be, say, a transition metal ion in water, where you can ask, should I treat the first solvent shell as water or should I treat it as aqua ligands on my metal? And so that's just something to bear in mind when you do modeling. <clears throat> so why is salvation important? Well, there are a number of reasons we could imagine. One is, if you think of any property as really just being the expectation value of an operator, in this case A, over some sort of wave function, well, there's a good chance that the wave function in the gas phase will be different from the wave function in solution. And we'll look at some specific examples of that in a moment. So you'd like to be able to compute these different wave functions and look at changes in properties, and that would be a salvation effect. Moreover, sometimes you're interested in how two molecules interact with one another in solution, so a, a recognition event, for instance, or a binding event. And in order for them to make contact with one another, that is to uh, interact their surfaces, if you'd like to think of it that way, they must desolvate those surfaces. You have to separate the solvent molecules that are in contact as you bring them together. So knowing something about solvation allows you to know something about the cost of desolvation. And finally, uh, taking sort of a global look, the potential energy hypersurface, which we've really spent a lot of time thinking about and computing, which dictates kinetics and equilibria, well, if there's a surface associated with the solvated system compared to the gas phase system, that's an interesting way to think about things, they're likely to be quantitatively and even qualitatively different in solution compared to the gas phase. So let me offer a few examples here where uh, some of those more general concepts can be uh, specifically indicated. And I'll start with uh, the solvatochromism of a particular dye. So this is a betaene dye. Betaene means a molecule that intrinsically has charge separation. So this is a phenoxide and a pyridinium ion separated within this molecule. Its name is ET30. It's been extensively investigated by Christian Reichardt over the years as well as others. And one uh, property of interest for this dye is the difference in energy between the first excited state singlet and the ground state singlet. So that is an absorption energy in the electronic spectrum, or an emission if we uh, emit from S1 to S0. And what one discovers if you make a solution of this molecule in different solvents is that the lambda max of absorption, which of course dictates what color you see within the liquid, 
varies tremendously as a function of solvent. So starting with anisole, which is certainly an unusual solvent, I did a lot of organic chemistry as a grad student, I don't recall ever dissolving anything in anisole, but if you do, you get a yellow solution, and then when you go to acetone, the solution turns green, and as you work your way up into alcohols, you can go all the way to red, so you can cover an enormous region of the spectrum with a total change in lambda max of more than 250 nanometers. And so this uh, truly is a picture of ET30 dissolved in methanol, isopropanol, and acetone. So if we look down here, that should be red, violet, and uh, green. And looking up here, well, they're pretty close. It's not the highest quality picture you'll ever see. This is a different laser dye. It is not, in fact, ET30. And now in fluorescence mode, as opposed to uh, absorption mode, nevertheless, you can see that there's an enormous change in its emission uh, wavelength, it's, it's lambda max for emission, as a function of solvent. It's always the same dye, it's just dissolved in different solvents. So here's an example of a property that's very, very uh, sensitive to solvation. A specific example of the desolvation penalty associated with bringing two things together, uh, one that people often think about that's important is an enzyme recognizing its substrate. So we're typically interested in this, the free energy in, say, aqueous solution, to bring an enzyme and a substrate together to make a bound complex. And one way to view that, if you were thinking about computing it, would be perhaps you could do a gas phase calculation. That certainly seems simpler. You just have to have, well, a relatively big enzyme, but perhaps a small solute, and then you compute the free energy to bring them together. And if you then have a way of uh, estimating, computing, whatever, the solvation free energy of the enzyme, the solvation free energy of the solute, the substrate, and the solvation free energy of the substrate, well then by the property of free energy being a state function, which means it doesn't matter how you get from point A to point B, it's always the same energy change, this change that we're interested in would be the negative of these solvation free energies plus the gas phase binding energy plus the solvation free energy for the complex. And so that taking this negative is equivalent to desolvating the enzyme and the substrate in order to bring them together and then resolvating the surface. So that's an example of desolvation uh, involved in molecular recognition. And finally, here's the nice global picture I like to look at, which involves two different potential energy surfaces. And the way one might think about this is, we spent a lot of time so far discussing different means, density functional theory, Hartree-Fock theory, semi-empirical Hartree-Fock theory, molecular mechanics, all sorts of ways to generate a gas phase surface, which is an energy as a function of geometrical coordinates. I can only graph two geometrical coordinates here, but we can imagine many. And so if you had some means at every point on your gas phase surface, which describes a geometry, to compute the free energy of salvation, which can be thought of as the free energy of coupling. And when you measure it experimentally, what's a free energy of salvation? It's associated with Henry's constant, it's often called. That is, it's the equilibrium constant for something wanting to be in solution compared to wanting to be in the gas phase at equilibrium, at a given temperature. And so if we did in fact have a way to do this for every point on this gas phase surface, we would have a way to construct, so I'd take this point, I'd add the free energy of salvation, it's negative apparently, so I'd have a new point down here. I would construct point by point a new surface, which I can call a solvated surface, because at every point it's coupled with the gas phase surface. And now that I have that surface, I can do all the same things I do with any surface. I can look for different minima, I can look for transition state structures, and just glancing at these two different surfaces, it looks as though this stationary point in the gas phase has been solvated a little bit better than this stationary point over here so that the reaction has become more exergonic compared to the gas phase. So that's an example of a, a potential energy analysis. And a specific example where maybe that would play a role, I won't do the whole surface, but I'll take an interesting slice, is the Menschutkin reaction. So the Menschutkin reaction is the SN2 reaction of an alkyl halide with an amine. Uh, normally it's actually substituted amines, but just for simplicity I'm going to illustrate here with ammonia. So we can imagine in the gas phase, ammonia, this upper curve is a gas phase curve as indicated here, ammonia approaches chloromethane, there is a backside attack in a classic SN2 fashion, 
of the ammonia lone pair displacing chloride, and the products are methyl ammonium and the chloride anion. Well, not surprisingly in the gas phase, this is a horrible reaction. You're separating charge, it's very unhappy in the gas phase, so while you find a weak sort of dipole-dipole complex, just a van der Waals interaction, uh, it just keeps rising in energy at that point, and there's not even really a good transition state structure in here in principle. And it just goes up, up, up as you separate these two charged species. But now, let's imagine the coupling with the solvent, that is, we can think of a free energy of salvation all along the reaction coordinate. Well, the reactants are neutral molecules. They're probably liked by water a little bit, so you go downhill in energy some. But the separated ions, well, water loves ions, right? Salts dissolve in water, and they certainly don't have much gas phase volatility, so there must be a huge salvation free energy. And in fact, they like them so much that it pulls the products down in free energy below the reactants, so that this reaction in the gas phase was barrierless and uphill all the way, becomes indeed a classic SN2 reaction. There is a transition state structure with a nice backside attack uh, sort of feature to it, and then it's downhill to products. And the Metschnitkin reaction is a great way to make alkyl ammonium salts. So more generically, while that's a specific example, uh, this slide just shows what are in fact the various definitions and the, the phenomena associated with salvation. So if this is a gas phase curve, then I can certainly identify this is a reactant minimum, this is a transition state structure, this is a product minimum. For this particular reaction, I guess, although I've labeled it reactant and product, the product is actually uphill in free energy relative to the reactant. Meanwhile, when I couple with salvation free energy all along this reaction path, I might generate a blue curve in solution. And one of the things you'll notice is the structure of the reactant, not all that much changed relative to the gas phase. And the difference between the two minima, because they're, they are slightly changed, but in any case, that defines the free energy of salvation of the reactant, minimum to minimum. The transition state structure, on the other hand, has moved tremendously gas phase compared to solution. And so evidently, as it is falling down this hill, it's not picking up as much salvation free energy as when it's up here uh, in the gas phase. And nevertheless, it's from stationary point to stationary point that defines the free energy of salvation of the transition state structure. And here as well in the product, there's been a, a bit of a change in geometry and it's minimum to minimum that defines the free energy of salvation of the product. And so if I want to think about delta delta Gs, I can sort of take combinations of these things. Here's the free energy of uh, activation in the gas phase. Here it is in solution. Here's the free energy of reaction in the gas phase. Here it is in solution. It's become exergonic, where it used to be endergonic. And by completing free energy cycles, I have ways to relate all of these. And I won't go through every possible free energy cycle. Well, so uh, the question arises, how might we go about modeling the interaction of a system of interest with the uh, surrounding medium? And there are really two alternatives, so-called explicit and implicit solvent modeling. And so explicit solvent modeling is really the, the blindingly obvious one in a sense. You take your system of interest and you expand it by including a whole bunch of solvent molecules. And in that case, you could go to the last slide and compute the blue curve. So let's just look at the last slide. Well, here's this curve, and it says it's a solution curve. So if I include tens, hundreds, thousands of solvent molecules, sure enough, I'll have some sort of a curve in solution. Now, it may be a little bit tricky to identify a reaction coordinate because thousands of molecules means uh, many thousands of degrees of freedom. So getting one single coordinate may be a, a bit of a challenge, but it certainly, as I say, is conceptually pretty clear. The implicit sol solvent modeling is a bit more subtle, and it says, okay, I'm not going to uh, represent the surrounding solvent. Instead, I will indeed compute the gas phase, and this is in red, because if you remember the gas phase curve on the last slide was in red. And then somehow I'm going to get the free energies of salvation at any point I'm interested in, and remember that the, on the last slide, here I'll show it again. So it's the green lines that couple stationary points, for example, and let you determine the free energy of the product relative to the, uh, in solution, relative to the gas phase. And once I've done that, I will uh, indeed have all the necessary 
free energy information to compute things like activation free energy and equilibrium free energy. And of course you could do it for every point along the reaction coordinate. That would generate the entire blue curve, but you may not need to. You may just need stationary points. The solvent would remain implicit either way. So in the next few videos, we're going to look at means to actually compute that coupling, uh, whether it be explicit or implicit. But before we move on to sort of the specifics, I do want to focus on this concept of the free energy of salvation. And I've called it the coupling free energy. And I just want to call out the physics behind that coupling. Because if you want to get the entire free energy of salvation, you're going to have to have a means to deal with all of the physics. And so it's, it's quite convenient to assign the free energy of salvation, this is the observable, as being composed of two components. Now, these two components actually are not individually observable. It is true that you can bias a system such that you really expect one to dominate over the other, but nevertheless, this is strictly a conceptual decomposition of the free energy of salvation, but a useful one. And so the first term here with the subscript ENP is meant to emphasize that this really has to do with the electrostatics of the problem. And so it deals with the electronic energy and the nuclear repulsion. These are uh, electrical phenomena. And the solute-solvent polarization that gives rise to a favorable interaction. That is, if I drop a dipole or a charge into a solvent, the solvent orients itself in such a way to stabilize that charge separation because the solvent itself either has permanent dipoles or you can induce dipoles and that leads to favorable electrostatic interactions. And it's really the dielectric constant, the bulk dielectric constant of a given solvent that dictates how, how capable it is of stabilizing charge separation. So high dielectric solvents like water or dimethylformamide or dimethyl sulfoxide, well known to solubilize polar species and polar means having charge separation. However, there are other components to the free energy of salvation that are quite important and sometimes they dominate over the electrostatics, particularly for solutes that don't have a lot of charge separation. And they include, uh, they're indicated here with CDS as subscripts. And so here's the, the expansion of that acronym. C is for cavitation. So if you think of transferring something from the gas phase into solution, well, your average solvent is not full of holes. Only if it's boiling is it full of holes, and even those holes are full of it itself as a gas. So you need to make a hole in the solvent to put the solute into it, and there's definitely a free energy cost associated with that to create a hole in a solvent. Dispersion. So dispersion we've talked about at some length as a quantum mechanical phenomenon. And remember that that is the induced dipole, induced dipole, favorable interaction that's associated with electron correlation. And so even extremely nonpolar molecules can be condensed precisely because of dispersion. So when I take a molecule out of the gas phase and I put it into solution, it will have favorable dispersion interactions and at the same time it will have broken up dispersion interactions between solvent molecules that used to be in contact. So that's some component. Now certainly if you're thinking carefully you'll say well dispersion's electrostatic, right? It's a induced dipole induced dipole. That sounds very electrostatic. But it's a fundamental one that is not so associated with fixed charges and so I'm going to keep it in a separate place. Finally there is uh, possible structural consequences of solvating a solute which could either be favorable or unfavorable in a free energy sense. And certainly the single most well-known example of that is the so-called hydrophobic effect. So when I take an alkane, for instance, and I put it into water, that reduces water's entropy at the surface of the alkane because the hydrogen bond opportunities are substantially lost to those water molecules in terms of how they can orient themselves and have good hydrogen bond interactions. So that adds a free energy cost and uh, that's a structural effect. It can be favorable as well. There are so-called structure making uh, solutes in, in water, for example. But in any case, it's part of the physics that does need to be captured. And so in the next series of videos, we're going to look at various ways to uh, do calculations, including solvation effects, and we'll actually start with explicit solvation next.